What's up guys, Derek, moreplatesmoredates.com. Today we're gonna to be talking about S23, which is arguably one of the most powerful SARMs um, in preclinical development right now. And this is gonna be the most comprehensive video on the entire internet about S23, I assure you that, as well as posts on the entire internet as well if you wanna check out the article version, which I posted back a couple of years ago and has been updated with the, to reflect the most current and up-to-date information. So. Without further ado, let's get into it. So S23 is undoubtedly one of the strongest SARMs in development right now. It has an extremely high binding affinity. It's very suppressive and it's a very potent muscle builder with a high level of tissue selectivity relative to anabolic androgenic steroids, or at least most of them. So what is it exactly? It's a selective androgen receptor modulator SARM currently under development for potential use as a male Hormonal contraceptive, it is still in the preclinical stage of development, meaning it has only been tested on animals, not humans. S23 exhibits a high affinity for the androgen receptor with tissue selective anabolic effects in muscle and bone with relatively less stimulation in the prostate, seminal vesicles, and other androgen affected tissues. S23 was created by modifying the structure of an older and less efficacious SARM called C6 by changing the paranitro group of C6 to a cyano group. Pharmacokinetic studies showed that C6 is 76% orally bioavailable and by swapping the paranitro group for a cyano group, S23 is able to achieve 96% oral bioavailability. The closer a SARM is to 100% bioavailability, the closer it is to complete absorption after oral dosing. This means that S23 can be administered orally as opposed to requiring injections to achieve maximum blood serum concentration levels, which is obviously advantageous when it comes to ease of use and adoption in a potential clinical setting. The preclinical data revealed that S23 is the most suppressive SARM in development and resulted in infertility in all rats treated. Expectedly, this raised interest in its potential clinical applications as a form of male birth control. The most obvious drawback of the long-term utilization of SARMs in a hormone replacement context or as a male hormonal contraceptive in the case of S23 is their lack of aromatization into estrogen. S23 is no different as it doesn't aromatize into estrogen in the body and would require exogenous estrogen administration in order to maintain normal sexual behavior among a myriad of other physiological functions that are facilitated by healthy endogenous estrogen levels. Contrary to popular belief, this also includes muscle building potential as a lack of adequate Estrogen in men will not only hinder bone health, it will also severely inhibit the accrual of lean muscle mass. Its potential efficacy in a hormone replacement therapy context is outlined in the preclinical animal data, but the scientists also acknowledge the limitations of S23 monotherapy when considering it in this context. S23 has become increasingly popular in the recreational bodybuilding community for its potent muscle building and body recomposition effects. Recreational users are quick to label S23 as a more potent alternative to S4, also known as Andarine, without the night vision side effect. S23 is also shown to decrease prostate size in studies, which is the opposite of a very common negative side effect of anabolic steroids enlargement of the prostate. This data is commonly misinterpreted though, as all SARMs will cause prostate hypertrophy in a dose-dependent manner, and this is specifically referred to in the study. S23 in particular was shown to maintain the anabolic activity in muscle tissue equivalent to therapeutic levels of testosterone at 0.1 milligrams per day in rats, while only stimulating prostate size up to 30% of an intact control rat which is a healthy, non-castrated rat with normal endogenous testosterone DHT levels. However, at dosages of 1 mg per day, S23 maintained the prostate and seminal vesicles at weights equal to or greater than that observed in the intact rats. S23 is commonly said to be able to reverse, you know, lower prostate size, but it's often not specified that 
SARMs are all capable of having a competing effect at the androgen receptor and suppressing endogenous androgen levels via the HPTA shutdown, so or suppression shut down in the case of S23. And you can lower the prostate size via that, but at the same time, there's a dose dependent increase in prostate size because there is inherent androgenicity in these SARMs, especially with S23. It's actually quite androgenic despite it being tissue selective. Anecdotally, S23 is one of the most side effect ridden SARMs of all due to its high level of androgenic activity relative to the other SARMs. Binding affinity. S23 has a very high binding affinity for the androgen receptor with a KI of roughly 1.7 nm. The structural modification of C6 didn't just increase S23's oral bioavailability, it also increased its AR binding affinity two times higher than that of C6, which has a KI of approximately 4.9 nm. To put this in perspective, RAD140 demonstrated excellent affinity for the AR with a KI of 7 nm. So the only SARM that has been trialed on humans and isn't still in the preclinical development stage that is also reported to have a formidable binding affinity to S23 is LGD4033, which has a KI of roughly 1 nm. So as far as SARMs in development that are formidable to the binding affinity of testosterone and DHT, the closest ones are probably LGD, S23, maybe LGD3303 as well. There are a few that haven't even really made it into preclinical development and don't even have animal models to reference yet that have higher binding affinities, but those have such limited data and speculation behind them that they're not even worth mentioning as of yet, but definitely something to keep an eye on. Mechanism of action. S23 has a very high level of bioavailability, which means it can be dosed orally without the need for injections or other inconvenient methods of administration. S23 binds to the AR with a very high binding affinity after ingestion and actively competes with testosterone and DHT for AR activation. Because of its high binding affinity, it is very effective at outcompeting testosterone and DHT for receptor sites in muscle tissue and bone. After binding to the androgen receptor, S23 increases bone mineral density, lean mass, and reduces fat mass in a dose-dependent manner. SARMs like S23 stimulate androgen receptors in a selective way whereby they induce a significantly greater amount of anabolic activity in the body relative to androgenic activity. The high level of tissue selectivity and competitive binding affinity at the AR may potentially avert some of the risks and side effects that can occur when endogenous testosterone is 5-alpha reduced into the more androgenic metabolite DHT. Some of these negative effects include but are not limited to benign prostate hyperplasia, prostate carcinoma, acne breakouts, and expedited male pattern baldness. The relative lack of androgenicity makes S23 a strong candidate for potential clinical applications for both men and women. However, while its tissue selectivity is superior to most FDA approved anabolic steroids, S23 has shown to be a full agonist in androgenic and anabolic tissues. This makes it unique from other SARMs in development that are more prostate sparing and selective for muscle tissue and bone and most likely disqualifies its viability as a treatment for anything other than a male hormonal contraceptive. S23 effects. So increases muscle mass and bone mineral density during the preclinical profiling of S23. It increased lean mass and bone mineral density. This was not in a dose dependent manner, however, which implies that S23 has a point of diminishing returns in an anabolic context. And dosages higher than that point would just result in higher levels of androgenic activity and HPTA suppression. In another study comparing the efficacy of S23 to testosterone, S23 attenuated muscle and bone tissue catabolism induced by glucocorticoid dexamethasone and castration more effectively than testosterone with less androgenic activity. The intention of the study was to establish how effective a SARM like S23 would be at preventing musculoskeletal degeneration in two scenarios that are common among men and women, one being musculoskeletal degeneration among hypogonadal men and the other being 
musculoskeletal degeneration induced by prolonged use of glucocorticoids. Skeletal muscle wasting currently has no therapy, and the current treatments have all been riddled with severe limitations, namely the androgenicity of anabolic steroids inducing viralization in women and androgen-derived health ramifications in both men and women, as well as severe insulin resistance among those treated with growth hormone. Growth hormone still has yet to prove it has any anabolic effect on muscle tissue whatsoever, and it is, in my opinion, illogically prescribed in absurd quantities to AIDS patients. Anecdotally, S23 is reported to be one of the most potent muscle builders among all of the SARMs currently in development. Fat loss, S23 decreases fat mass in a dose-dependent manner. While the preclinical profiling revealed dose-dependent fat loss, I believe this is an indirect effect rather than the direct mobilization of stored fat in general. Anabolic agents do not burn fat. As a human accrues more muscle mass though, their basal metabolic rate will increase in parallel. This is guaranteed. Therefore, anything that can increase lean muscle mass will also indirectly impact total daily energy expenditure. Via increasing muscle mass, S23 will also increase the body's metabolic rate because it has more muscle tissue burning through more calories, even at rest, which will indirectly result in increased fat loss in a dose-dependent manner in parallel to muscle mass accrual. It is very likely that S23 can indirectly increase fat loss and that amount of fat loss is entirely dependent on how much lean muscle gain is facilitated by S23. Male birth control. The preclinical assessment of S23's efficacy as a birth control pill is commonly misinterpreted. So S23 is shown to be one of the most suppressive SARMs in development, which is what sparked the interest to explore its potential as a form of male birth control. Despite S23 exhibiting a dose-dependent suppression of Spermatogenesis, spontaneous recovery was achieved in all treated rats after cessation of treatment. This makes it an ideal candidate as a potential male hormonal contraceptive. However, what is often not mentioned is the fact that infertility could only be achieved when S23 was administered in conjunction with estradiol benzoate. To put this in perspective, one of the common ways male to female transgender hormone therapy is facilitated is with the administration of an antiandrogen in conjunction with estradiol. The reason for this is that estradiol can lower testosterone production on its own by as much as 95% and the antiandrogen is used to clean up the excess androgen receptor activation that would otherwise induce androgenic activity in the body. The estradiol also maintains physiological functions that are facilitated via healthy estrogen levels as having zero estrogen in the body is not only horrible for women, but it's unhealthy for men as well. Estradiol has a dose dependent increase in testosterone suppression. And because the serum levels in men have to remain below a certain threshold to prevent feminization, estradiol monotherapy is not an efficacious treatment for male hormonal contraception. The main purpose exogenous estradiol serves in a male contraceptive context is filling the void left when testosterone is severely suppressed by the S23. This alternative method of therapy will require exogenous estradiol administration to maintain healthy levels in the body as there will no longer be any endogenous testosterone aromatizing into sufficient amounts of estrogen. While antiandrogens pick up the slack for transgender hormone therapy, the minimal dosage of estradiol in conjunction with the S23 picks up the slack in a male contraceptive context by further suppressing LH and FSH levels to 100% infertility levels. Estradiol basically equates to the suppression of LH and FSH but not enough for complete infertility. S23 also equates to suppression of LH and FSH but not enough for complete infertility, but estradiol in conjunction with S23 does equate to enough suppression of LH and FSH to achieve 100% infertility, and that's at certain dosages though. S23 monotherapy displayed only biphasic effects in the testes and epididymis, and estradiol treatment in conjunction with S23 was necessary to mediate a 100% infertility rate. The infertility rate was inconsistently achieved though among the varying dosage groups and further exemplifies how different bodies will be suppressed to varying degrees. 
and that complete infertility can likely only be consistently achieved when an exogenous progestin is added to further suppress LH. Personally, I believe that S23 induced suppression of the HPTA is not unique from other SARMs or steroids and the SARM is simply more suppressive than most. And it's commonly believed that S23 inherently has some unique contraceptive effects, but this is not the case. In my opinion, it's just more suppressive milligram for milligram than other SARMs. Regardless of which androgens are used, eventually the endocrine system will become so taxed from hormone suppression that hormone replacement therapy will become an inevitable practice that will need to be adopted to maintain a high quality of life. And even if exogenous hormones weren't utilized, this would eventually occur for all men simply due to hormonal decline with aging. I also do not think that the ability to bounce back from S23 induced infertility is unique as is often implied. I'm confident that most healthy men will be able to regain fertility regardless of their level of HPTA suppression by utilizing a combination of HMG, HCG, and Clomid. And I have yet to find one individual who this hasn't worked for, even among anabolic steroid users who have blasted for over a decade straight. I believe the same results found in the S23 study could be achieved with another very suppressive SARM like RAD140 or LGD4033 in conjunction with oral estradiol, but this is just my own personal speculation. S23 is the most promising option among the current SARMs in development as a potential male hormonal contraceptive simply due to its higher level of suppression. However, it is still not a turnkey solo treatment and will require estradiol and progestin use in conjunction with it to truly be a consistently effective contraceptive. Increased female sexual desire. When a woman goes through menopause, their ovaries may start producing fewer hormones. Menopause-induced suboptimal testosterone, estrogen, and progesterone levels can result in a severe drop in sex drive. Estrogen is one of the primary hormones responsible for libido in men and women, and using synthetic estradiol in menopause to bring levels up to where they should be has shown to alleviate menopausal symptoms in many women. However, for some women, this isn't the root of the issue and they may still be androgen deficient. In addition, exogenous estradiol administration will further suppress endogenous testosterone production and exacerbate the issue if the root of the libido issue is a deficiency of androgens. This is where therapeutic androgen replacement may become necessary to fill the void left by suboptimal testosterone production. However, competent doctors who understand this and are knowledgeable enough to treat it properly are few and far between and often women are left scratching their heads because their doctor doesn't have an answer for them or won't prescribe testosterone to testosterone deficient women. S23 was evaluated in a preclinical model assessing its effects on sexual motivation. Expectedly, it increased female sexual desire. Anything androgenic will increase libido and considering the fact that S23 is a full agonist in androgen affected tissues, it's not surprising that it had a positive effect on female libido. The reason this may be advantageous is that the tissue selectivity of S23 is still much better than testosterone, so it could potentially be a viable treatment for menopause-induced androgen deficiency in women. As far as S23 reviews, anecdotal and recreational reports, despite S23 being developed as a male hormonal contraceptive, 99% of the anecdotal reports you will find online are in the context of it as a performance enhancing agent. Most S23 reviews have reported similar findings with the following characteristics being common among S23 users, impressive lean mass builder, notable increases in strength, improved body composition and fat loss. Um, this is probably indirect via increased muscle mass, curl and thermogenesis. Uh, mitigates catabolism in a calorie deficit. Enhanced levels of muscle hardness, dryness and vascularity similar to DHT derivatives and zero water retention. Despite all of the potential benefits that are typically the focus of S23 reports, the SARM has a handful of common unexpected side effects that have been consistently reported that are unique from most SARMs and are odd to say the least. As far as S23 versus other SARMs in particular, if you compare S23 to RAD140, 
S23 has a higher binding affinity than RAD140. It's more suppressive, but it will also build more muscle and strength. With that being said, S23 is more androgenic than RAD140 and will result in more androgenic side effects. Anecdotally, RAD140 is much more androgenic than it appeared to be in its preclinical profile. However, S23 still seems to exceed it in terms of overall androgenicity. S23 will also produce a conditioned, more dry effect um, than RAD140 will um, in terms of something similar to what you would expect from DHT derivatives. Whether this is via dehydration or a direct conditioning effect, this remains unknown, but pound for pound, it is safe to say that S23 is a more potent anabolic and androgenic agent in general than RAD140. Doesn't mean it's a more efficacious SARM though for actual clinical applications but as far as just sheer strength in all aspects it's stronger s23 versus s4 s23 is purported by many to be a jacked up version of s4 without the night vision side effect and it's true that s23 does not carry the same vision side effect as s4 and is a more potent muscle builder however it also has a less favorable level of tissue selectivity than s4 and will induce far more androgenic activity milligram for milligram. Even at what would be considered high dosages, 30 milligrams of S23 has shown to be far more androgenic than 100 milligrams of S4. In a purely performance enhancing muscle building context, S23 is the more effective SARM at building muscle. However, when it comes to tissue selectivity and fitting the description of a novel SARM, S4 significantly outperforms S23 as it acts as a full Androgen receptor agonist in muscle tissue and only a partial agonist in the prostate. S23 half-life. The mean terminal half-life of S23 is 11.9 hours. The half-life of S23 in humans, however, is unknown and would require mathematical estimation or a clinical study, which is the more ideal way to determine it. S23 side effects. Prostate enlargement. Despite S23 being hyped up for decreasing prostate size in rats in its initial preclinical rodent model, it has proven to be a less efficacious SARM due to its inferior tissue selectivity. While S23 is still more tissue selective than non-selective androgens like testosterone, which 5-alpha reduces into DHT, it has shown to be a full agonist in androgenic and anabolic tissues. This means that SARMs like LGD4033, which are more tissue selective, will induce much less androgenic activity at the same level of anabolic activity in muscle and bone. While S23 will greatly suppress endogenous testosterone production, thereby reducing prostate size, this only proves that it is less androgenic than testosterone and DHT. The prostate size maintained by S23 is still greater than what SARMs like S4 and Austrian would maintain at the dosage required to replicate therapeutic levels of anabolic activity in muscle and bone. S23 is one of the most misunderstood SARMs and it will increase prostate size in a dose-dependent manner just to a lesser extent than testosterone, which 5-alpha reduces into DHT, and other non-selective anabolic steroids. Increased body temperature. A common side effect reported by S23 users is increased body temperature. As a result, S23 increases sweating and increased water intake seems to become necessary with moderate and high dosages of S23. Um, causes night sweats, which is really weird, similar to Trenbolone. Reports of night sweats from S23 are common. Why this occurs is unknown. However, it is entirely possible that S23 increases the body's metabolic rate, thereby increasing thermogenesis. The increase in body temperature would then cause sweating and can be very noticeable at night when you're lying under the covers and wake up eight hours later in a puddle of your own sweat. Cramping. This is likely derived from the dehydrating effect S23 appears to cause through Increased body temperature, the more you sweat, the more electrolytes you lose, the more dehydrated you are. Your potential for cramping will increase in parallel. The mechanism behind S23 cramps are likely mediated by this and may require 
an increase in water and electrolyte intake, increased aggression as 23 users commonly report very blatant increases in aggression similar to that of RAD140 and highly energetic anabolic steroids. This further solidifies the androgenicity and relative lack of tissue selectivity of S23 as huge increases in aggression are flagship markers of highly androgenic compounds. At the dosages being used recreationally, it is very likely that significant amounts of androgenic activity are being induced in the body by S23. Regardless of the fact that S23 is a SARM on paper, it is not as selective as SARMs like MK2866, Austrian, S4, Andrine, etc. It is a full agonist in androgen affected tissues and will display a higher incidence of androgenic side effects as a result of that. Typically, increased aggression only occurs when androgen index increases in the body. This is why more androgenic steroids are commonly used pre-workout for a quick boost in aggression before training. Acne. Because S23 is a full agonist in androgen affected tissues, acne breakouts from S23 use are far more common than with other more tissue selective SARMs. Androgens stimulate the sebaceous glands and induce greater amounts of sebum production. Sebum is that gross stuff on your face that causes oily skin. If you don't wash your hair or your face very often, you'll notice it gets like an oily like film almost, just like oil on your skin. That's, that's the sebum. Excessive amounts of sebum can clog the pores and ultimately result in acne breakouts. In general, the more androgenic a compound is, the greater potential it has for causing acne. Hair loss. Hair loss derives from the androgenicity of S23 as well. Androgens will cause hair follicle miniaturization, which will ultimately cause hair loss. The more androgens you exert on your body, the more hair loss potential you have in most cases. This is commonly misinterpreted by individuals who believe that DHT is the only hormone that can cause hair loss, but the fact is that any androgenic hormone will induce androgenic effects in the body in a dose-dependent manner and S23 is not exempt from that. The severity of how much hair loss an anabolic agent will cause is generally predicated upon its level of androgenicity, hence why DHT is much worse than testosterone for hair loss. Despite the fact that it is so much worse, it does not make testosterone hair loss safe at all, though either. Testosterone simply has a lower androgen index than DHT and is far more hair safe relative to harsher androgenic metabolites and several DHT derivatives. It definitely isn't hair safe though, and S23 certainly isn't either. Compared to other SARMs, S23 is one of the least hair safe SARMs in development. Lowering of lipids. Expectedly, S23 induces a dose-dependent lowering of lipids, LDL, HDL triglycerides, any anabolic androgenic compound will suppress HDL cholesterol in a dose-dependent manner. This has been consistently shown in other clinical trials conducted on other SARMs as well. Every single SARM that has been evaluated has shown this same dose-dependent suppression of lipids. Testosterone suppression. Just like anabolic steroids, SARMs have all consistently exhibited suppression of luteinizing hormone and follicle stimulating hormone through the HPTA. The result of this is decreased natural testosterone production in a dose dependent manner. S23 is one of the most suppressive SARMs, hence why it is being evaluated as a potential male hormonal contraceptive. In intact male rats treated for 14 days, S23 monotherapy suppressed LH levels by more than 50% at doses greater than 0.1 milligrams per day. Gynecomastia. While the incidence of gyno is low among users, it is certainly possible. One advantage S23 has over other SARMs in a gyno context is that its androgenicity will likely have an antagonizing effect on estrogen in the body. The more favorable the ratio of androgens to estrogen is in the body, the less likely the incidence of gyno is even when estrogen levels are elevated out of range. While heightened androgenic activity defeats the purpose of SARMs tissue selectivity, it helps prevent gyno, which is a plus. All SARMs can cause gynecomastia as they suppress the HPTA and can throw off the ratio of androgens to estrogens in the body. In addition, by binding to the androgen receptors with a formidable binding affinity to that of endogenous androgens, 
more endogenous testosterone will divert to aromatize into estrogen. Suppressing testosterone production itself can cause an imbalance in the ratio of endogenous androgens relative to endogenous estrogen in the body, creating a hormone imbalance that encourages gynecomastia development. Estrogen management would be prudent during any usage of SARMs. Based on what we know, S23 has a more favorable preclinical profile than other SARMs when it comes to gynecomastia risk due to its full agonist activity in androgen-affected tissues. Liver toxicity. Other SARMs have shown potential liver toxicity concerns, all but minimal at their therapeutic dosage amounts. There's no preclinical data on the potential liver toxicity of S23, so it would be prudent to assume that at high enough dosages, it would present the same limitations of other SARMs when it comes to taxation on the liver. Okay, so that is the comprehensive overview of S23. Hope you guys enjoyed it, found it informative. Uh, please like, subscribe, drop a comment. Helps the algorithm out. Appreciate it when you guys do that. Check me out on Instagram. Follow me there at more plates underscore more dates. Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat. Check out the podcast link in the video description below. Drop a five star rating there if you can. It's much appreciated. It helps spread the content. Also, if you want to support the channel, you can check out the links in the video description below with stuff I'm affiliated with or stuff I produce in private label and create or formulate myself, like Gorilla Mind, the nootropic formula. Thank you guys for watching. Talk to you soon.